The next slide in talks would be Samuel Giovanni. And Samuel mm -hmm. will talk about uh, quantum localization of Frankel excitons. Okay, so, can, five you see, minutes. can you yep. see the screen? All is good. Yes. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Professor Tretiak. Uh, just let me start by thanking the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak. It's been a great conference. I really enjoyed. And uh, okay, today I'm going to talk about quantum localization of Frankel excitons in molecular semiconductors. And I also want to acknowledge the people who actually helped with this work. Lorenzo Cupellini from the University of Pisa, Antoine Karoff, you already met on the first day, and then Jochen and his group uh, that were there all the way through. <laughs> so, okay, our uh, objective is actually to use non-adiabatic molecular dynamics to study electronic processes in organic semiconductors, trying, trying to go beyond hoping or band theories. And you may have seen on the first day, the talk of Antoine Karoff, where we, uh, where he actually showed that we were able to study charge carrier transport in molecular crystals like uh, rubrin, for example. Uh, in this work, we wanted to go one step further and try to uh, apply this methodology to study electronic processes in organic photovoltaics. And of course, as you, may, as you have seen from the previous talk, we have many processes occurring at the interface. You have exciton transport, dissociation, free carrier generation, and charge recombination. And Jochen's group is doing a lot of work in this direction. And this, this talk will be mainly about the first step, if you want, which is exciton diffusion. And I'm not gonna go into the detail of the uh, methodology. I just want to say that the excitonic wave function we have is expanded in a basic set of Frankel uh, localized excitons. And we propagate this wave function according to the tally fewer switches surface hopping. And we couple this motion to the, to the nuclei, to the nuclear motion. And we try to go to very large systems. And so the systems that we have studied so far are uh, still crystalline. So we have anthracene, which is a useful benchmark because it has been studied many times before with different methodolog methodology. And then we have uh, an oligothiophene, uh, which is a prototype for P3HT, a PDI derivative, and also an acceptor donor acceptor molecule. Uh, which has been shown uh, high power conversion efficiency, so high, high diffusion. And of course, the first thing you have to do is to compute the excitonic couplings. And the excitonic couplings is uh, uh, usually uh, written as a sum of a Coulomb interaction plus a short range interaction. And the Coulomb interaction is the interaction between the transition density of the donor and the transition density of the acceptor integrated over space. And you can find ways of approximating this interaction very efficiently, for example, using transition ESP charges. Now, the question is how good is this Coulomb interaction compared to the full uh, excitonic coupling? So, and the, probably the best reference, the best you can do is to use a multi-state diabatization method where you calculate the adiabatic states uh, of, a, of the donor acceptor system, and then you try to find the best uh, diabatic, maximally localized diabatic states and the interactions between them. And so here, what I'm showing is uh, this Coulomb uh, coupling compared to these multi-state uh, multi excitonic couplings. And you can see that for all these systems, the correlation is actually pretty good and we have a small uh, error. And so we can safely neglect the short range uh, part. And so the other important thing is that we can now uh, see how the excitonic couplings is for these different systems. And you see that it's increasing as you go from anthracene to more interesting uh, application relevant systems, and whereas the reorganization energy decreases. So you uh, can already see why this molecule is, is more efficient as, as a conductor, conductor of excitons. And we computed the diffusion coefficient uh, from our non-adiabatic non dynamics. And what I'm showing is this diffusion uh, versus the number of molecule over which this exciton is delocalized. And you see that for anthracene, you have localization over one molecule. And so the exciton is really going through an activation barrier in order to be transferred. And this is a slow process. Whereas for uh, this other molecule, the CDSN, you have delocalization over two 
molecules and the diffusion is one to two order of magnitude faster. So bottom line is that smaller reorganization energy and larger excitonic couplings, they give larger delocalization and faster transport. And I already see <laughs> Sergey here, so I just will go very quickly. So no time to go into the detail, but you can compare exciton transport and a charge transport on the same system. And for anthracene, you can see that the exciton is actually much more localized because of the stronger uh, exciton, uh, local exciton phonon coupling, whereas the charge is more delocalized over five molecules or so because of you have a smaller reorganization energy. And the diffusion is, is much faster, almost two order of magnitude again. And with this, I thank uh, again the group and I also want to acknowledge, uh, thank uh, David uh, Beljon for useful discussion on this project and for having me in months. So thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Samuel. So the next lightning talks will be by Antonio uh, Alvertis. Please start uh, sharing your screen. Yeah. Can you see this over there? Yep, absolutely. Can you put it? Yes. Right. You're good to go. OK. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk. I'm Antonio Alvertis. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Cambridge and visitor at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the USA. And I'll talk to you about modeling of non-perturbative exton phonon coupling in organic semiconductors today. So if we look at the typical phonon density of states of an organic semiconductor crystal, it looks as follows. We have this narrow region of low frequency phonons that are thermally activated at room temperature. And this mostly consists of um, intermolecular motions. And um, then we have this very large region of high frequency modes, which are not thermally activated. This is due to the fact that car carbon and hydrogen have low masses in these materials. Um, and these are mostly uh, localized carbon-carbon stretching motions and so on. So these motions, the thermally activated motions are strongly populated, can couple strongly to the exciton. These quantum fluctuations perhaps as well. So we wanted to understand a bit how these different kinds of phonons affect exciton energies in organic semiconductors. And to do this, we um, employed a finite differences uh, methodology. So very briefly, you can show analytically that the exciton energy at a temperature T is equal to this vibrational average of the exciton energy at different displaced geometries U, where we have an integral over displaced geometries times the so-called harmonic density function, which is essentially a manifestation of the Bose-Einstein distribution. So you can perform a Monte Carlo integration uh, for this expression. You generate n displaced configurations u, distributed according to this harmonic density function. And at each of these, you compute the exton energy with the electronic structure method that you prefer. Uh, for our work here, this was GWBC methods based on Green's functions. So uh, we, we first applied this methodology to the ACIN series of organic semiconductors, starting from naphthalene with two fused rings, all the way to pentacin with five rings. And we start here from the singlet exciton state. So what I'm plotting here is the change of the singlet exciton energy due to the effect of phonons with the blue line only due to zero point uh, motion. And with the red line due to the additional effect of increasing the temperature from zero to 300 Kelvin, so thermal fluctuations. And what you see is that uh, when you're in the smaller systems, quantum fluctuations dominate by far. They can renormalize the external energy by about 0.2 EV. And the thermal fluctuations start to take over as you go towards the larger molecules, which you see have also more delocalized, especially delocalized excitons. And the role of exciton delocalization actually becomes much more clear when we now look at the triplet exciton state. So here, for the example of pentacin, triplets are generally uh, much more localized compared to singlets due to the lack of repulsive exchange. And you see that thermally activated phonons basically have no effect at all on their energy, whereas um, quantum fluctuations lead to substantial renormalization of triplet energies, up to 0.3 V in the case of naphthalene. So the physical picture that emerges is the following. Um, so as we go towards the more delocalized excitons, 
uh, thermally activated phonons uh, become more and more relevant because those modulate uh, orbital overlap. Uh, whereas localized extons don't really care about these motions and mostly care about quantum fluctuations that are localized. So just uh, to show you, we can actually systematically improve the agreement of experiment when we account for these effects without, uh, flu uh, thermal flu without quantum fluctuations in black, with these effects in red, comparison to experiment in uh, blue. And finally, we generalize to a very large set of molecules, the so-called TL set of molecules. So perfect agreement with experiment would be on the Y equals X line. The green line shows what you get without vibrations. And the red line here shows you what you get with TDDFT plus zero point renormalization. And this correction can really be really, really large in some cases more than one is in. So that's all I had. I leave you here with the references uh, that I spoke about. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer by email or on the Slack. Thank you very much. Antonio, uh, thank you so much for your talk. And uh, Martina, I'm just wondering if Hello. you could uh, start sharing. Yep, yeah. how are you? Uh, let me share the screen. Please confirm that you see the presentation in, what yep. do you see? And now please okay. put it in the uh, presentation yeah. mode. It's all good? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, fantastic. So hello everyone. Uh, so the challenge, the problem that I would like to discuss with you today, it's about the development of methods for the simulation of excitations in system of realistic sizes, large systems, like for instance, uh, OLEDs. This kind of materials normally have a complex uh, electronic structure and they are disordered molecular materials. A particular class of OLEDs that we have been uh, looking at is TADF uh, materials, which you may know as one of the newer generation of OLEDs. They are mainly uh, characterized by thermally activated delay fluorescence, which is facilitated by this uh, triplet state laying very close in energy to this singlet state. And the result is that you have a reverse intersystem crossing thermally activated and you have better performance uh, than standard OLED. So when it comes to modeling this kind of uh, electronic structure, the important quantity is delta EST, which is the delta energy between T1 and S1, because of course, being able to predict delta EST correctly means being able to predict which molecules can exhibit this behavior. Of course, you need an accurate method to describe the electronic structure of the single molecule to predict delta EST correctly. But you also need a method that is uh, able to be incorporated within frameworks that can uh, compute energies up to thousands of atoms. And this is because uh, environment effects and disordered effects can be very important in modeling this kind of system. So we need to think about very large systems as well. And of course, density functional theory represents one of the choices because it has a very uh, good trade-off between accuracy and computational cost. We know that in standard implementation, one can do about uh, 1,000 atoms, but there are also linear scaling uh, approaches that can do uh, more than 1,000 atoms. So even if we know that we're going to use DFT approaches uh, to do uh, accurately the electronic structure, we also need to always classify our excitations between starts in our calculations. So I here propose a very simple descriptor that we have developed, which is simply based on the, uh, the distance between HOMO and LUMO. And uh, I apply this to a number of molecules. And what emerges is for TADS molecules like 2CZPN, which is the one that I'm presenting here, we find that uh, the excitation character is somewhere uh, a mixed character between being local and charge transfer. And this is true for also other OLEDs. So this poses an extra problem on what kind of methods shall we choose for our purpose? As uh, we know that, for instance, in its standard implementation and with standard functional, CDDFT is very good for local excitation, but fails for charge transfer excitation. And it's still too expensive when you want to incorporate it in, within framework to do thousands of atoms. And CDFT, on the other hand, in its started implementation based on spatial constraint is very good for charge transfer, not so good for local, but on the other hand, it's a cheap method and has a very uh, flexible framework. So we decided to take advantage of the positives of constrained DFT, uh, which is that uh, the good computational cost and the simplicity of the framework to propose and develop a novel uh, constrained DFT called the TCDFT. 
So in this novel formalism, instead of imposing uh, uh, the standard spatial constraint on the charge, we impose a specific orbital transition between uh, two orbitals, for instance, or more, depending whether it's a pure excitation or a mixed excitation, like for instance, a homolumo transition. We developed this method within the wavelet-based uh, code, the big DST, which, is a, which offers a support function-based formalism and uh, allows for linear scaling as well. And we apply this new uh, TCDFT on a set of molecules which present both the local kind of excitation and mixed kind of excitation. And we compare it with, uh, again, standard delta SCF and TDDFT calculation with standard uh, functionals and semi-local functionals and hybrid functionals. And what we find is that we found a comparable accuracy of our method TCDFT uh, as a TDDFT and delta SCF with hybrid functional, but with reduced computational costs because we only apply the TCDFT with semi-local functionals. So you can see here how it behaves consistently, but also in nicely, it shows a robust behavior also with respect of the excitation character. In fact, in here, you can see how uh, TDDFT shows its standard failure with charge transfer excitation with semi-local functional. And this is further enforced by this plot that I'm showing you here, where I'm plotting the descriptor for the charge transfer character against the energy difference between TDFT and TDDFT. And you can see that for the molecules where the local uh, excitation character is higher, you have a smaller energy difference between TCDFT and TDDFT. And the more the charge transfer character increases, the more uh, this energy difference increases. And this is because TDDFT starts failing with charge transfer with standard functionals. So this confirmed the robustness of our method. And in addition to that, because it is implemented within a linear scaling formalism, which is designed inherently for large systems, is ideally suited for exploring the environment effects on the delta EST. So we made in a very simple approach where you take morphology from MD simulations and we can extract larger and larger um, clusters to assess the effects on the environment on Delta ESD using TCDFT. And uh, together with the information coming from static disorder uh, investigation, we can uh, improve the description of the Delta ESD. And I'm done. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you could stop sharing. Done. And June, if you could start sharing. Did I stop? Please? Yeah, I yeah. did. Okay. John, are you there? Sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to share. Uh, can you see the presentation? Now put in the okay? presentation. I think it's it's in presentation mode. Nope. Okay, let me uh, unplug it. How about now? Nope. You need to uh, How about now? click another no. Yes, you're good to go. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. So I'm, I'm Jun Yen from Jane Yersen's group at Imperial College. But today I want to talk about charge transfer states and voltage loss in organic solar cells. So speaking of charge transfer, it's a well-known concept, uh, especially in biology and chemistry. And it's in the field of orga organic solar cells, it's also very important because it controls free charge generation. So however, the study about charge transfer states didn't exist, exist in 2006 when people observed a linear correlation between the open circuit voltage and the effect bank gap. So later on, independent study observed the direct emission from CT state. In a more detailed study, people observed that open circuit voltage actually uh, scales linearly with the energy of CT state. So all those studies are brought up huge interest trying to understand the fundamental links between open circuit voltage and the, and the CT state properties. So um, actually, actually the, one of the major uh, breakthrough happened actually in uh, 2017 by Cohn van der Waals group, where they observed that the, uh, the non-radiative voltage loss uh, actually decreased linearly with the energy of CT state. So they invoked the concept of energy gap flow trying to, uh, uh, trying to understand this behavior. They, they, they proposed a simple model to, to describe this behavior quite well. So this is a very important step towards, towards understanding fundamental links between uh, CT properties and uh, open circuit voltage and the losses. So we took one step further trying to implement more properties CT state into a model uh, because in reality we, we found that the energy gap flow is not always, always present. As you can see in the, in the, in the experimental result, we, 
we obtained before that actually is anti energy gap law behavior, which can only be explained by the change of the oscillator strengths using our model. So, apart from that, it, as you can see on the right hand side, there are a bunch of different parameters can also have a major impact on the relationship. So, we so uh, I want to highlight that the, the reorganiz reorganization energy actually play a major role in this, uh, this relationship. So, also, people have been interested in very much on the low offset system, which is very re uh, related to the uh, long flowing substance that is newly developed. So, so in the low offset system, there are two things can happen. One is the hybridization between the local local external state and the charge transfer state. Another thing is, is if you're under thermal equilibrium, equilibrium condition, you will see a thermal repopulation from charge transfer state to, to LE state that the, both methods both, both, uh, method can uh, result in uh, in enhanced emission from charge transfer states, therefore reduce the non-radiative voltage loss. Therefore, that is the main reason for the low non-radiative voltage loss for those low offset systems, which is all. So what we also interesting a case when the phase behavior is very complicated. Uh, so we introduced a model uh, trying to implement a random distribution of charge transfer states, which is called static disorder. We use this model, and the one thing to, one thing we want we want to emphasize that is that the beta balance between photo emission and absorption should be obeyed regardless of the shape of the of the density of states of the of the CT uh, CT states. Uh, as a result, if you have a, a huge amount of disorder, of course, you will in, in, enhance the rate of long radiative transition. As a res result, you will have very low uh, open circuit voltage. Therefore, you can't have a high efficient highly efficient device. So what I also want to emphasize here is that um, sort of traditionally used single state analyze in trying to get the uh, uh, energy of CT state as, as well as the reorganization energies can be problematic if you have a huge amount of static dis disorder in your device. And uh, also in, in, the, in the last bit uh, in, in the presentation, I want to share one, one experimental is, uh, uh, example that we did where the phase behavior, behavior is really complicated as you can see on the Luminescence uh, spectrum, you can see two different distinct uh, CT state that result from uh, the Crisma and the Morpheus interface. That so this so this uh, behavior can only be explained if you have a if you have a, a static disorder model. So we uh, we we trying to use our model to implement a change of density of CT state and trying to uh, trying to reproduce, but can, but we can only uh, do it qualitatively because uh, it's quite complicated to do for this complicated system. So we, we we can kind of expand the result uh, experimental results and quite well and quite happily to do that. So with that, I want to conclude by saying uh, the properties of charge transfer states are important and directly relate to the uh, analysis of voltage loss. And notably, energy gap law is not always present depending on the material you study and the properties it has. And the various properties can affect the uh, voltage loss, especially I want to emphasize also the strength reorganization energy composition as well as summarization. In the last bit, I also want to mention that static disorder should be considered in blends with complicated phase behavior. And of course, the presence of a static disorder is not good. It reduces the open circuit voltage loss and questions also the use of single state analyze. So with that, I want to thank the group I'm working with, especially Jenny and the co-authors, Ali, Mohamed Furin, also people provide the material, Ian Andy, also the club, uh, club uh, sorry, the founders, and of course, thank you for this amazing opportunity um, to be uh, speaking here. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. I wonder if you could stop sharing. And yeah. Taherek, please start sharing. Can we see your slides? Can you see my slides? Yep, you're good to go. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for this amazing event. That's been a great pleasure uh, seeing all these great scientists at the same event. I'm also grateful to my collaborators, uh, particularly to my PI, Alessandro Trizi. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about some of our recent uh, works on charge transport in molecular semiconductors. So I will start with some uh, brief description, uh, description of charge transport uh, theories for molecular semiconductors. Uh, then we'll explain how we can compute the mobility for hundred thousands of structures. And then we will see what we can learn from such a screening. 
As it was explained uh, several times during the workshop, the charge transport of molecular semiconductors cannot be described by conventional uh, uh, theories. And as a result, over the years, a number of advanced theories have been developed, such as the one uh, developed by Jochen Group, the one explained by Simone, by Frank, and Marcus. Uh, there are a number of nice reviews uh, in this topic, and if you are interested, the first one is the perspective article from our group highlighting the need for a balance between theory and computation. Uh, among the listed uh, theories in the previous slide, the transient localization theory uh, provides the simpler approach for mobility calculation, as it doesn't need any quantum dynamic propagation, and it's quite, uh, it provides a quite convenient framework for a screening, as it was explained in perfect detail by Simone, I skip further explanation on this. So having this theory in a recent project, we, start, we, we screened the Cambridge Structural uh, Database containing over 1 million crystals. In the first step of the screening, we identified the molecular semiconductors and computed the charge transfer integral for all of them. Then in the second layer of a screening, by reducing the database to those with decent bandwidths, we ended up with 5,000 structures and computed the local and non-local electron phonon coupling and the charge mobility for all of them. The most challenging yet innovative part of the project was the method we developed for dynamic disorder calculation, uh, which was a QNN method and the detail can be found in the paper. Uh, basically, this uh, method enabled us to uh, compute the dynamic disorder for 5,000 structures, while, as you know, the current theoretical methods could not evaluate this property for more than a handful of structures. Uh, throughout this work, we identified a number of uh, high mobility structures. Some of them have never been considered for mobility calculation, uh, for, uh, for transport applications. Uh, we could realize what are the most important parameters affecting the mobility and could rank them in terms of their importance. As such, we understood that the molecular area, the dynamic disorder, the transport to dimensionality, the local electron phonon coupling, and the largest transfer integral are the most important parameters affecting the mobility. Then uh, we observed that, in fact, our top mobility materials are not ideal with respect to all the important parameters. As you can see here, we have uh, properties that they are not in their optimal regime. Then uh, by computing the correlation between the parameters, we observe that the parameters of, of interest are either uncorrelated or constructively correlated, meaning that basically they can be improved together. As such, suppose we have a hypothetical material, then by setting all these important parameters in their top 15%, uh, we achieved the mobility of uh, around seven, and then by going to the top one percentile, we, we achieved the mobility of 70 that can be considered as the upper limit of mobility in this materials class. Speaking about uh, uh, properties improvement in these uh, materials, uh, we have more or less some general design strategies for majority of these properties, and the only one which remains without uh, general design strategy is the dynamic disorder, because as I said, uh, the number of evaluated structures have been so limited. Therefore, in the following work, we try to understand what's the common origin of molecules showing a smaller level of dynamic disorder. And uh, basically, we observe that uh, the strength of dynamic disorder is controlled by five important properties that I don't have time to go into the details. Just let me uh, tell you about the most interesting one. Uh, basically, according to our analysis, the molecular, uh, the, the molecular pairs uh, arranged in the head-to-tail configuration such that the conjugated cores uh, do not lie on the same plane, such as the one on the top row, are the best in terms of showing a smaller level of dynamic disorder. So this head-to-tail arrangement of the molecules is highly counterintuitive. So this brings me to the end. Uh, so in conclusion, we need advanced theories for mobility calculations in molecular semiconductors. Uh, TLT is really a convenient framework for a screening. Now we have some estimation of largest plausible mobility in, in molecular semiconductors and some uh, design strategies to uh, reduce dynamic disorder and boost the mobility. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your question via email. Thank you so much, Tahereh. And we are actually almost on time. And I believe if anyone has uh, any burning questions to our lightning talks presenters or to Irene? Anyone? 
So, well, uh, let me uh, ask a brief question to uh, Tahirek. I'm just wondering in your high throughput screening, if yes. uh, it is possible to put well-defined uncertainty quantification on the prediction of various quantities. So is it uh, something that uh, you have been considering seriously? Uh, for the descriptors, of course. Uh, so if I understood your question, you are asking about some point of benchmarking. Uh, so, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we are using DFT for uh, charge transfer integral calculation. So often there are some ways like ch changing the best set of functional, you can, you can uh, see how good is your result. Then for the phonons calculation, that, uh, that is the most uh, challenging part, then we have some accurate uh, uh, methods to compute the, uh, the, the phonons, such as the work we have been doing with UC Davis recently. Uh, but as I said, uh, so they, they can be used only for benchmarking, like the, the tennis structure. So you cannot really apply them for 5,000. So for benchmarking, of course, we have some uh, precise strategies. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, we can like shape the validity of our uh, different parameters. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank all the participants in this session. And... Uh, you for listening it and now i guess we have a break uh, in place let's reconvene in i guess 13 minutes <laughs>